Number five on this list is the Hay Adams Hotel. This hotel is located in Washington DC and has quite the history to it. USA Today writes, quite possibly the most famous hotel in the capital, the Hay Adams has hosted many a politician, including the Obamas before inauguration. In 1884, best friends John Hay, Abraham Lincoln's private secretary and later a secretary of state, and Henry Adams, the author and descendant of John Quincy, built their homes on the plot of land where the hotel now sits. In 1927, nine years after Adams' death, the houses were raised and replaced by the hotel that stands today. Adams' wife, Marion Hooper Adams, killed herself on the site in 1885 and her spirit reportedly haunts the hotel. Guests and staff say they can hear a woman crying softly, disembodied voices and doors opening and closing on their own. What is it about hotels and people taking their own lives? It feels like so many hotels are haunted because some Someone left the world far too early and usually it was their decision to do so. Marion Hooper Adams is no exception and she has made this hotel a very inhospitable place to stay. Sometimes you hear the faint cries of a creature or spirit and they go away, but apparently her spirit absolutely wails. All the time there are screams and crying heard. In fact, it's so repetitive that it gets less scary and more of an annoyance than anything else. People literally just can't sleep at night because they're constantly listening to her crying over how her life ended. It's also a nuisance when they find things missing all the time. Marion likes to move things and steal items. Oftentimes, the valuables of these people are gone if they leave the hotel for an extended period of time and then come back. Now, maybe this part of the legend is actually just one of the hotel workers stealing stuff and blaming it on her, but either way, things will go missing if you stay here. It's overall just a horrible experience being at this hotel for an extended period of time, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Number four on this list is Hotel Provincial. Located in New Orleans, this hotel is teeming with paranormal energy. USA Today says the two-story Hotel Provincial with 94 rooms in the historic French Quarter is a retreat into Old New Orleans. Like many New Orleans properties, it also claims to be a popular paranormal activity hub. Like other area hotels, the property acted as a medical facility for wounded Confederate soldiers and is said to still possess their spirits. From distressed soldiers and operating doctors to pools of blood guests have reported it all. If actually staying at the property seems too spooky, it's also a stop on many walking ghost tours of the city as well. Pools of blood, guys. Literal pools of blood. Just imagine walking into your hotel room after a long day of doing stuff, getting in your PJs, moving the comforter over to your bed to slip in, and then seeing a bunch of blood just ooze out. This has actually happened to people before. That would absolutely scar me for life if something like that ever went down. Not to mention people actually getting physically scarred when they come here. People have reported getting attacked by unknown paranormal entities while staying here. Waking up to a spirit completely ravaging them and having no idea how or why it's happening. This is not the type of hotel that you want to stay at and you will literally risk your safety if you do. Number three on this list is the Feister Hotel. This one has been around for a while and has got a lot of people scared who've stayed here. Travel and Leisure says, the historic Feister Hotel opened in Milwaukee in 1893 with elegant interiors and advanced technology for the times, including electricity, individual thermostat controls, and fireproofing, making it one of the most sought after accommodations in the city. The hotel is supposedly home to a number of spooky sightings. In fact, several MLB players have reported their own personal ghost experiences in the hotel and some are even too scared to stay there again. So guys, I actually run a podcast all about the MLB. Because I run this podcast, I'm pretty knowledgeable about the MLB. I have literally heard of this hotel before even doing research on this video. Players will flat out refuse to play here now because they get way too scared and can't get any sleep when they're there. Then obviously when they play their game the next day, they suck because they just spent the entire night basically fending for their lives in this haunted hotel. It's really too bad that it has to be this way because this is apparently one of the nicer hotels in Milwaukee. It's definitely one of the oldest and back then it was the best place to stay if you wanted a luxurious night. Hopefully the ghosts that reside here eventually leave and we can all enjoy it once again without getting completely haunted. Number two on this list is the Emily Morgan Hotel. 
The Emily Morgan Hotel is located in Texas and is probably the most haunted in that entire state. It wasn't always the lovely and renovated hotel that it is today. Prior to this being a beautiful place to stay, this was actually a hospital and a place for doctors to stay. Obviously, during that period, it saw a lot of illness and death, and that has tainted the space. But believe it or not, though, this isn't the only set of tragedies that this location has seen. Before it was a hospital, before it was anything at all, on this very site where the hotel currently sits was the Battle of the Alamo. The Battle of the Alamo was one of the most critical battles in the Texas Revolution. The battle lasted for 13 brutal days in 1836. It was between the Mexican soldiers and the Texan soldiers. The Mexican soldiers won out and killed every single one of the Texan soldiers who were there defending their fort. This battle is one of the most famous in American history for how horrible and brutal it was. It's no wonder that the land here is haunted and will infect basically anything that's built here. It also doesn't help when the hotel used to be a hospital which saw its fair share of horrible things too. Nowadays, this hotel has a whole cast of paranormal characters. Soldiers from back in the day have been spotted roaming around the halls and patients and doctors as well. There have even been a few occasions where people have reported having visions of being on the battlefield as if they were transported there. Definitely not the spot to be staying on your vacated Texas. And finally, number one on this list is La Fonda on the Plaza. This is a hotel located in New Mexico that has been host to plenty of tragedies. Travel and Leisure says this beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico hotel has an incredibly rich history. Since 1609, a number of inns have been located on this very site, but a handful of events may be the cause of continued hauntings. According to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the ghosts of a judge shot in the lobby, a businessman who gambled everything away at the hotel before jumping down a well, and a bride killed on her wedding night are just a few of the spirits that you may come across during your stay here. That's three spirits too many for me, guys. Whenever situations like this arise, I start to question things. What I mean is that, isn't this a little bit odd that three totally separate, completely different tragic events all took place right here at different times? Sure, it could be a coincidence, but it seems like a rather sad one if you ask me. Maybe there was always something about this space that was just a little off. Maybe people who come here just get hit with horrible luck. Maybe this hotel was built on some sort of ancient ground that it shouldn't have been built on, and this is the horrible reaction. I obviously can't say for sure, but something's fishy about this hotel, and I wouldn't recommend checking it out if I was you. Number five on this list is the Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. Most haunted museums, or anything like that, are all kind of phony and corny. This one though, this isn't for the faint of heart. Thrillist says when Zach Baggins opened the Haunted Museum in Las Vegas, he did his homework and picked the creepiest place possible. The attraction is inside an old Victorian home that dates back to 1938. It was owned by a family haunted by a child who died due to surgical complications. Later, when the home was vacant, intruders broke in and held satanic rituals in the basement. Adult actress Jenna Jameson actually grew up in the house and swears the stories are true, but doesn't like to talk about it too much. Today, you can take a guided tour of the Haunted Museum, frequently used as a filming location for Baggins' ghost adventures on the Travel Channel and Discovery Plus. The museum packs a lot into one visit with more than 30 rooms. Things start off relatively tame with a look at spooky artifacts and a gambling parlor in a closet full of creepy dolls. But the pace picks up with exhibits dedicated to notorious serial killers, an up-close look at a Volkswagen van used as a death machine by Jack Kevorkian, and a haunted hallway of killer clowns. It's best not to give away too many spoilers, but at one point you'll face an item described as the most haunted object in the whole world. You will even get to explore the basement at some point, which many people believe to still be extremely haunted. You gotta wonder why the heck so many horrible things happened here. Haunted child, satanic rituals, other questionable things that have probably not been linked to the public. 
I guess it makes sense to have a haunted museum here, but obviously bringing in all of these other haunted items has just further promoted paranormal energy and now this is clearly a hot spot for spirits and ghosts alike. Only go to this museum if you can handle a good scare. Number four on this list is Rhyolite Ghost Town. This abandoned town is full of scary spirits, ghouls, and maybe a lot more. Thrillist says, take a short road trip out of Las Vegas and spend the afternoon exploring the ruins of Rhyolite, one of the most compelling ghost towns in the country. A hub of mining activity during the gold rush, the town was quickly abandoned when the boom went bust following the panic of 1907. Wander around and you'll see the scattered remains of a bank, jail, and train depot. The landscape looks more like a nuclear war zone than a ghost town, but just as sinister and perhaps still home to the spirits who once lived there many years ago. We have talked a ton about ghost towns on this channel before. Something about ghost towns seems to attract spirits. Maybe like the sudden absence of people leaves a void that these spirits seem to want to fill. It also doesn't help the situation when you have people doing some very questionable things at these ghost towns. Considering they are totally abandoned and out of the way, ghost towns make for some pretty good places to have some covert meetings and deals go down. This one in Las Vegas, it's no different. Apparently a decent amount of criminal activity happens around here with a lot of drug deals taking place here. Every now and again, these deals can go sour, and usually that leaves a body. Murder and a gang presence aren't great things to sprinkle in when a town is already dealing with paranormal activity. For safety purposes, I recommend staying away from this town at all costs. Number three on this list is West Gate. So, I am actually breaking the rules with this one a little bit because I think that you should definitely visit this place if you have the money. Thrillist says, some Las Vegas residencies never quite end. Elvis Presley redefined what it meant to be a superstar entertainer in this town with more than 600 shows over seven years at the International Hotel, which became the Las Vegas Hilton and is now the Westgate. The property continues to honor the king with a statue in the hotel lobby. Although Elvis passed away in Memphis, some believe his soul remains in Vegas with his ghost haunting the Westgate International Theater and a lavish rooftop villa the singer called home whenever he was in town. It's not cheap, but you can book the penthouse yourself. Just call the desk and ask for the Elvis suite. I don't care how creepy it may be or how scary he would look, but if there is an opportunity to see the ghost of Elvis, then that is absolutely something that I definitely want to cash in on. Imagine you pull up to your hotel room after a night of drinking and then you get to have a late night conversation with one of the greatest rock stars of all time ever. I don't think that Elvis would be the type of dude to hurt you or anything like that, even in ghost form. So as long as it's safe to do so, count me the heck in, dude. I want to go to Vegas and party with the ghost of Elvis. Number two on this list is Las Vegas Academy of the Arts. As somebody who graduated university for acting, an art school being haunted is just a tad bit triggering. Thrillist says, the Las Vegas Academy of the Arts is a magnet school that specializes in music, theater, and other fine arts. Yet its legacy dates back to 1931 when it was known simply as Las Vegas High School, the first official high school in Las Vegas. The site has seen its share of renovations over the years, although two of its three original buildings remain on campus with their sturdy brick exteriors still in place. Generations of students have swapped stories about Mr. Petrie, a ghost that roams the hallways and haunts the school's theater. Some claim to hear strange noises or feel a chill, especially when rehearsals carry over to evening hours. So who is Mr. Petrie? Some believe he was a former teacher. Others claim he owned a home that previously stood on the site of the school and burned down in a mysterious fire. Nobody knows for sure. All everyone does know is that Mr. Petrie is a menace. 
Let me tell you folks, acting is hard enough as it is without some creepy ghost causing problems for you mid monologue. And apparently he likes to do that all the time. Many shows and performances have been ruined by Mr. Petrie. And the worst part about it is that he will only show himself to one person at a time sometimes. So the lead actor will be out there doing Hamlet and then all of a sudden see a ghost in front of him causing problems. The actor will naturally freak out and lose their mind, but no one else will see the ghost, they'll just see the actor on stage losing it. Which kind of makes the actor look like a bumbling idiot, but really they're getting attacked by some ghost. Try a different art school if you're looking for an artistic education. Number one on this list is Bollies. If Trivago or any other site like that tries to recommend you stay at Bollies, don't fall for it guys. Thrillist says, the worst fire in Nevada history tore through the old MGM Grand Hotel on November 21st, 1980. The blaze killed 87 people, mostly due to smoke inhalation, while helicopters rescued survivors from the roof. The property was eventually sold and renamed Bollies, while a new version of the MGM Grand reopened a few blocks south on the Strip. The tower engulfed in the fire is still part of the hotel, and guests sometimes claim to see unusual shadows in hallways, hear strange noises, and notice furniture that mysteriously moves in the rooms, especially on higher floors that saw the worst of the flames. Many believe the strange activity is caused by the spirits of those who didn't survive the tragedy. 87 people dying in a tragedy like that is always going to leave something terrible behind and that's what we have here. 87 spirits are now restlessly floating around in purgatory at this place. They tried to remodel and change the name and forget everything that happened, but an incident like that cannot be forgotten. The people who died and their spirits, they can't be forgotten. They're still there to this day haunting the place and trying to seek help. Many of the reports haven't talked about these ghosts being evil, but just being misunderstood and trying to get out of this place. They didn't ask to die in a fire, and they also didn't ask to be left in this purgatory place forever. I would imagine that they want to move on, they just don't know how to get free of this. Hopefully someone can figure out a way to save these souls and let them pass on for good. Number five on this list is the Carolina Inn. This inn has actually been voted one of the most haunted in America by a few different lists. The University of North Carolina says the Carolina Inn was built in 1924 and quickly became a popular hotel for visitors and graduates of the university. In 1948, the Carolina Inn's most long-lasting guests checked in and apparently never left. Dr. William Jacox was a fun-loving man with a witty sense of humor, had recently retired from practicing medicine, and decided to make the Carolina Inn his final home. He lived in room 252 for 17 years before his death in 1965. As shared by the Carolina Inn, guests that have stayed in Jacox's old room report being inexplicably locked out of the suite. One time, the lock was so stubborn that a workman had to use a ladder to break into the room. Visitors have also noticed strange occurrences such as messy bath mats and previously closed curtains being pulled wide open. Some have encountered the smell of freshly cut flowers despite none being in the room and felt their bodies become strangely cold for no apparent reason. This is only part of the stuff that goes down at this room as well guys. Some people have reported seeing a poorly dressed man approach them looking for an unlocked door and then if they show it to him, he runs away screaming. It's thought that this is the ghost of Dr. William Jacox. I don't know why unlocked doors scare this dude so much, but anyone who's gonna spend 17 years in this hotel is probably a bit of a weird dude. Unless you want to deal with a crazy old doctor ghost messing with you all vacation, I'd stay at a different inn. Number four on this list is the new Hanover County Library. I don't know why guys, but something about haunted libraries is just so intriguing to me. Like it just seems so mystical and mysterious I guess. This haunted library is located right in Wilmington. There is a woman that haunts this place who's believed to be a patron. Apparently she used to donate quite generously to this library and in death doesn't want to leave it behind. She's not the only ghost that walks the halls here and haunts the books. There's a male poltergeist who makes his presence quite known as well. 
He apparently died in a duel that happened here many years ago before this land was turned into a library. Nowadays, these two ghosts make it very hard to do any serious learning or studying considering they haunt the place so much. The woman isn't too bad, she just shows up and looks super creepy, but from my reading, she only actually punishes those who cause harm to the library or make fun of it. Those who come here to learn and to read, she leaves them be for the most part. The man, however, is certainly quite the pest. He often messes with those that come here and makes it very difficult for people to accomplish anything. I love libraries, I think that we should all go to them more often, but maybe just not this one specifically. Number three on this list is Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was a critical fort during the American Civil War. It was used by the Confederate Army and was pretty instrumental for them from 1861 to 1865. This fort was used to protect an important trade post there that the army needed. They defended this place for those four years, but then in 1865, the Union Army came in and was finally able to capture it. This battle was a very bloody one and was actually huge for the Union Army and the overall scope of the war. Apparently, there was a lot of death at this fort, and that death it's never really gone away. Now, this fort is teeming with paranormal activity. Visitors will often report hearing gunshots coming from thin air. The sounds of many footsteps all running at once as if people were charging ahead. Orbs of energy appear in front of them from no apparent source. There are two very famous ghosts that haunt this place as well. Robert E. Harrell and General William Whitling. Robert was apparently an outcast who died under mysterious circumstances and has not been able to rest since. The General was actually taken prisoner and killed at Fort Columbus, but he returned to this place because he feels regret for how he failed in life. He was apparently responsible for defending this place and was not capable of doing so. A very haunted fort that I wouldn't recommend going to. Number two on this list is Lydia's Bridge. Who is Lydia and why does she have a bridge and why is it haunted? Well, Lydia is quite the famous ghost. This is a true ghost. Like when you think of a ghost and a ghost story, this meets all the criteria for a good one. Spectrum Local News says, People traveling between Jamestown and Greensboro on US Highway 70A said they've encountered the ghost of Lydia, a hitchhiker. If she's picked up, she gets into the car and vanishes before she reaches the requested destination. Various versions of the Lydia legend have been passed along over the years, and there are apparently 11 different versions of the story that are set in North Carolina. It's common for folks to go ghost hunting for Lydia near the bridge. In the book, Looking for Lydia, historians Michael Reniger and Amy Greer cite the 1923 death of Annie C. Johnson as the real life Lydia who died after a car flipped in 1920. That is a story with some history, man. Literally since the 1920s, this has been going on and there are 11 different versions of the story. A story like this isn't just made up. It's not just something that one person posted on creepy pasta that became a thing. No, this has been part of the identity of North Carolina for a century. Countless people have picked up this woman and then had her disappear right before their very eyes. Car accidents have happened for people driving this woman and then getting so shocked that they spin off the road when she disappears. Lydia or Annie is a real ghost who stalks drivers along this road and especially this bridge. Although she isn't inherently evil in nature, as I said before, accidents have happened when people realize they were just driving a ghost around. I have no idea where Lydia is trying to get to, but trust me, you probably don't want to be the person to take her there. And finally, number one on this list is the Devil's Tramping Grounds. This is in reference to a very strange patch of soil in North Carolina. For decades, this circle of dirt has allowed nothing to grow on it at all whilst the area surrounding it is home to luscious wildlife. The Sun Journal says, regional legend maintains that Satan frequents the area on his nightly walks, pacing the circle as he contemplates his nefarious deeds. Normal vegetation surrounds the circle, but only a wiry grass grows inside it and no plant life of any kind can be found on the path itself. Visitors have also claimed to see red glowing eyes in the circle. Now there could be any number of reasons for why nothing is growing on this patch of dirt. Simply because an area of land cannot grow wildlife doesn't automatically mean the devil himself has anything to do with it. But throw in the fact that there are two red glowing eyes there, plus a few other creepy occurrences and... 
we might just have something demonic afoot. Locals have reported putting objects in the center of the circle, then coming back a little while later and having those same items moved outside the circle. As if someone or something did this deliberately. The thinking is that this circle is a place used by the devil to dance or to perform rituals that we don't understand. Having things inside his circle of death doesn't make for a great dancing spot or sacrificial zone, so those things need to get moved. That's why we see the red eyes in the night and there's an overwhelming sensation of dread in the area. It's the devil doing his devilish things. A daring reporter actually decided to test this theory one evening and slept in the exact spot in a tent. He said that the entire evening he heard the distinct sounds of dancing footprints outside his tent, but couldn't spot anything when he looked out. My dude literally could have been like one foot away from the actual devil. No idea how he managed to make it through the entire night, but honestly, solid respect. Either way, this guy's story is an exception, not the norm. I'd avoid this place at all costs, because if you don't, the devil might actually make you pay for it. Coming in at number 5 we have South Manitou Island in Leland. South Manitou Island is part of an island chain in Lake Michigan that extends north to the Straits of Mackinac. The only public access is by ferry from Leland, Michigan. The island consists of a ridge of tilted layers of limestone buried under a blanket of glacial debris. 16 miles offshore from the Lilano Peninsula, featuring 300 foot sand dunes, deserted shoreline and empty campground, it's about as terrestrially creepy as you can get in Michigan. In the 1800s, the island became a popular harbour for ships traversing the newly built Erie Canal into the Great Lakes and on to Chicago. One local legend surrounds a ship full of passengers stricken with cholera stopped at South Manitou where sailors buried their victims in a mass grave, some of them still alive at the time. Soon after this incident the first appearance of ghosts and hauntings began. The mass grave is believed to be near the old cemetery just north of the bay campground. This is also near where the old dock used to be located. Additionally the passage between mainland Michigan and Manitou is one of the deadliest sections of Lake Michigan. Michigan. This is due to a sudden weather change, creating a navigational hazard, causing over 50 known shipwrecks. Traffic was quite busy here during the late 1800s and there were frequent accidents where ships would literally run into each other. Off the coast of the island lies the shipwreck of the SS Francisco Morazin, where rumours say a young island boy died after trying to explore on his own. There are also two cemeteries on the island and an ancient cedar forest where voices are said to be heard. The haunting of this island island is so bad it has driven park rangers to go mad and demand to be taken off the island. One ranger even confessed to hearing voices, footsteps and slamming of doors inside buildings that were otherwise unoccupied. Coming in at number 4 we have Masonic Temple. With over 16 floors and 1000 rooms this gothic temple is one of the most striking buildings in Detroit. Furthermore this is the largest Masonic temple in the world. According to rumours there are hidden passageways, rooms and staircases so be careful as you might get lost quite quickly within the walls of this temple. The most famous urban myth associated with the temple is that of the architect George D. Mason. Legend has it that Mason went bankrupt funding the construction of the temple. He was going through financial difficulties and was very close to foreclosure. Due to this stress, George D. jumped to his death from the roof. This story will back up the fact that many reports of a ghost climbing the steps to the roof of the building as if stuck in a loop of his darkest moment. Even scarier, additional Additionally, guards frequently find the door to the roof unlocked, even when it was just checked moments earlier. Additionally, the temple has various cold spots and doors are reported to close suddenly. One of the roof doors is said to swing open just moments after it is locked by a watchman. Many people report the feeling of being watched while inside of the building. Coming in at number 3 we have Doherty Hotel. The Doherty family has owned and operated the hotel since it opened in the 1920s. The Doherty men were and remain the business managers. However, as the current owner Jim Doherty tells it, it was the Doherty women who were the heart and soul of the business. The hotel has a colourful history. During Prohibition, it was a speakeasy, a place for backroom gambling and adult entertainment. It was also a meeting place for the Mafia and Purple Gang. Here they worked 
worked out their differences. In 1938, the hotel was the site of one of the Michigan's most notorious murders. Asaya Lebo, former Purple Gang attorney turned Purple Gang businessman, was murdered in the bar. He was shot by his cousin and business partner Jack Livingston and sadly passed away. Ever since, there have been numerous hauntings. Some believe it's Lebo who haunts the ground or grandmother Helen Doherty who passed away at the hotel. But there is one thing for sure and it's the many ghost stories that are now associated with the hotel. Guests, visitors, investigators, employees and the owners have all had some kind of paranormal experience at the hotel which includes perfume scent wafting through occasionally, loud knocking, bedroom doors open and close by themselves and dark apparitions and shadowy figures have been spotted anywhere from the lobby to the top floor. Also the spirits of other murder victims roam the halls, lobbies and rooms while some can be seen, others prefer to just make noise. Coming in at number 2 we have Michigan's first state prison. Established in 1838, Michigan's first state prison remained in operation through 1934. The prison served as the nucleus for the city as it spanned some 20 acres. Over the years it relocated and at one point became the largest walled prison in the world with around 6,000 inmates. In 1952, in response to poor medical care, brutality from the guards and bad food, two maximum security prisoners took hold of a guard and used his keys to release other inmates. A days long riot ensued, resulting in nine guards being held hostage. Additionally, the riot resulted in the deaths of several inmates and guards before it was extinguished by the National Guard. The inmates fought for and won a list of 11 demands for reform. Today, the old prison has become the Armory Arts Village, a residence and studio for local artisans. Apartments are very contemporary and halls are covered with artwork. In spite of its modern renovations and freshly painted walls, though, rumors persist of its haunting. Visitors, workers, and artists of the space claim some prisoners and guards still haunt their former home. Residual sounds of riots are also frequently reported due to the prison's history of such occurrences. Judy Krasnow, an employee at the renovated Arts Village, hosts daytime historic tours of the prison, so a visitor can see the hauntings for themselves. She is also a resident of the prison and lives on site. She has confessed she believes her apartment, which was once a series of prison cells, has ghosts. Furthermore, Judy is not the only resident who believes that. Even though the upper floors have undergone renovations, the underground section that holds solitary confinement remains structurally intact. Although cells have been removed, there is intensity in this area that cannot be denied. And finally, in at number one, we have the Whitney Restaurant. Located on Woodward Avenue, restaurant Whitney was the former mansion home of David Whitney. David was one of the Midwest's wealthiest lumber barons at the turn of the century, and he built this magnificent 21,000 square foot home in 1894. The mansion was restored in the mid 1980s, and since then, reports of unexplained paranormal activities have been reported. Such as shadow figures have been seen on the second floor, disembodied voices have been heard, and other strange phenomena have occurred. It is known that the mansion is haunted by Whitney and his first wife, Flora. Flora always wanted to live in a mansion but died before the home was finished, leaving Whitney to raise their four children. A year after Flora's death, Whitney married her sister Sarah, leaving Flora's ghost to forever live in distress. The paranormal activity within the restaurant is not for the faint hearted, as there have been reports of the elevator travelling between floors on its own with no one inside to operate it. Furthermore, ghosts have been witnessed on the upper floors, with one staff member seeing an older man looking out the window. The staff member approached the man, asking him to leave, and right before the staff's eyes, the man and vanishes into the floor. Other reports include noises that sound like silverware and kitchenware being handled and or stacked and table settings keep getting moved around by some unseen presence. The outhouse is said to be the most haunted part of the property. It was originally built for Whitney's slaves and has been largely untouched for years, mostly due to the fear of paranormal. Inside the outhouse is a dining table that is set for the afternoon tea and has been untouched for as long as anyone can remember. Today it is still perfectly set but covered in a thick layer of dust. Adding to the ghostly atmosphere, the outhouse has no electricity, so sits in the darkness at night. A tour guide who once worked at the Whitney insisted that the building was haunted for his experiences working there. The worker claims a group of dolls vanished from a room inside the building. Also, the worker has reported hearing his name being called from an empty area of the building. The Whitney Mansion is an elegant and beautiful property, but has high body counts, a haunting history, and plenty of supernatural sightings still happening today. Number five on this list is the Sealbach Hotel. 
Seabach Hotel is located in the heart of Louisville and has been there for quite some time. Virginia Travel Tip says, in 1905, the Seabach Hotel in Louisville opened its doors. For more than a century, this exquisite historic hotel has functioned as one of Kentucky's most important historical landmarks. The hotel, on the other hand, is notorious for its ghostly activity. Patricia Wilson, the lady in blue, is one of the hotel's most famous sightings. She was a woman who had recently divorced her spouse and intended to meet him later at Sealback to try and work out their differences. Unfortunately, her husband died in a car accident and never showed up. She was devastated by the loss and she died not long after that. As a result, guests notice a woman in a blue outfit strolling around the hotel. Other ghosts have been reported at the hotel and they include a woman dressed in old worn out clothing who was approached by a staff member attempting to communicate with her, but then she disappeared. Most of the encounters with this woman have been tame, but there have been some that have gotten quite aggressive. Some teenagers were apparently making fun of her or doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, and she responded by literally clawing and scratching at one of them, leaving horrible marks behind. The victim also said that it felt as if she crawled into his brain and told him horrible secrets about himself that he'll never be able to forget. A hotel like this is supposed to be nice and relaxing, but based on what I've read, I don't know if that's going to be the experience you get at Sealbach. Number four on this list is the Talbot Tavern. Really too bad that this place is haunted because it would have been a pretty nice spot to get a brew if it wasn't. Virginia Travel Tips says, built in 1778, the Talbot Tavern is located in Bardstown, Kentucky. Currently, the Haunted Kentucky Tavern serves as both a restaurant and a five room B&B and it's known for being haunted. A former accountant recalls coming across a man in a long coat strolling across the top floor. He then turned to face her and began laughing uncontrollably. Another famous hotel resident was the lady in white who forced a couple to flee the hotel in the middle of the night since she was hovering over them while sleeping. Many workers and visitors to the residence have related accounts such as orbs floating around the rooms, flashes of lights without cameras being seen, objects moving on their own, and doors opening and closing when no one's in the building. I, for one, am not trying to wake up to a ghost just hovering over me, guys. Honestly, it might give me a heart attack and, well, I'd never wake up again. This place is weird because no one really knows why it's as haunted as it is, but there's no doubt that it's teeming with paranormal energy. Pick a different place to go get a drink if you're in Kentucky. Number three on this list is the Kentucky State Penitentiary. We always got to include the creepy jail on one of these lists, guys, and this is Kentucky's. Virginia Travel Tips says, the Kentucky State Penitentiary is situated near the Tennessee border on a sharp bend in the Cumberland River. In the 1800s, a maximum security jail was built there. It is a gorgeous place from afar, but up close, it is a death and ghost machine, according to a local author and paranormal investigator. Thousands of men have been executed in the prison's electric chair, known as Old Sparky. During his death row cell inspections in the late 1980s, a guard had a terrible incident where no one stayed. He was greeted by a prisoner who was reading the Bible. When he returned to his office, he asked about the prisoner's meal, only to discover that no one was in that cell. When he returned to the cell, he discovered that it was empty except for a small Bible on the floor. Yeah, kind of weird. More strange occurrences were recorded around the institution, with many reporting seeing a reflection of an inmate who attempted to shock them. Okay, so honestly guys, I want to take this as seriously as possible, but Old Sparky? Like, imagine dying in a thing called Old Sparky. Like, I think it's meant to electrocute people, but why does the killing chair sound so cute? Kinda sounds like something that you name your dog, not a murder weapon. Anyways, Old Sparky has certainly done its job though, and now the place is super haunted. Most of the prisons we talk about on this channel you can go visit if you like, because they're all typically abandoned. That's not the case with this one though. The Kentucky State Penitentiary is still fully operational and has tons of prisoners in it. Not only do these people have to chill in jail, but it just so happens that their jail is also haunted. Number two on this list is Mammoth Cave. So we actually spoke about Mammoth Cave on this channel before in our series about top five terrifying caves where evil awaits. So 
If that interests you, then go check it out. It made that list because it was super haunted and naturally it has to make this one as well. It is, as you'd expect, located in Kentucky. It is the biggest cave in the state by far, which is why it's named Mammoth Cave. Most of the cave has been unexplored, which is kind of nuts considering we've already seen about 400 miles of it up until this point. This has been an area of interest to people for thousands of years. Back 4,000 years ago, it's believed that people used this cave to bury their dead. This was the first encounter this cavern saw of death, but it definitely wasn't the last. After the War of 1812, these caves were sold off and used as a place to mine salt. The workers of these mines were slaves and oftentimes were worked to death down there. After the salt had been mined, this place functioned as a spot for sick tuberculosis victims to go. Obviously, this created more death in this place and just contributed to what is a very haunted area now. Today, we get an array of ghostly apparitions popping up to people. Ghosts from all the way back 4,000 years ago have been seen, still lingering and clinging onto this cavern. People have seen the visions of slaves calling out for help and ghosts of sickly individuals as well. H.P. Lovecraft, one of the most famous fantasy horror writers, was inspired by this cave. Anything that inspired that guy is probably a spot that you want to avoid. And finally, number one on this list is Nada Tunnel. What is it about tunnels that's just so creepy? It feels like there are a few locations in the world that seem to attract paranormal activity and tunnels are definitely right up there. Virginia Travel Tips says, Nada Tunnel, also known as the Gateway to Red River Gorge, is located in Powell County, Kentucky. Works of a one-lane tunnel on a two-way road began in 1910 and concluded in 1911. Drills and dynamite were used to rip through the limestone rock during construction and one worker died while attempting to dissolve a stick of frozen dynamite by placing it next to the fire which, you know, resulted in the dynamite exploding. As a result, the man's spirit is claimed to haunt the Kentucky Tunnel. Others allege that the location is haunted as a result of a climber who died in this region. These incidents are linked to the mythology of a green orb appearing in front of the tunnel. If you plan to enter the tunnel, keep in mind that it only fits one automobile at a time, therefore check for other car headlights before proceeding. This is one of the coolest haunted places in Kentucky for the sake of it being engulfed in nature. So, it may look really cool, but the haunted nature of this spot makes me think that it should be avoided. Man, imagine literally getting blown up by a stick of dynamite, like that might actually be the worst. Granted, my dude did stick the dynamite literally right next to a fire, so I feel like he might have brought this one on himself a little bit. I'm not really sure how the climber would have died in this tunnel, but you gotta imagine that he screwed up if he was climbing in a tunnel. Either way, the spot is definitely riddled with these spirits and they manifest themselves as this glowing green orb. Now, there haven't been too many reports of this thing being super dangerous, but it is definitely creepy to say the least. Locals don't really travel down this pathway for fear of the orb, and what it could potentially do to them. Also, on a total side note, I just want to bring up the fact that this is a one-way tunnel on a two-lane road. Like, how dangerous is that, guys? What if it's foggy or something and I can't see all the way down the tunnel to the other car? That is literally the dumbest road design I have ever heard of. Maybe the legend was just created by the locals because they know how dangerous this freaking tunnel is. Regardless of what it is, I recommend staying away. Kicking off the list at number five, the mission of San Miguel, 1610. The birthplace and historic site, the original San Miguel church was most likely built shortly after the founding of Santa Fe in 1610 and is claimed to have been the first ever church built in America. Churches are already creaky and creepy, then this is the oldest one in the States. Okay, here we go. This church was built right across the Santa Fe River in the area referred to as the Barrio de Analco, which was inhabited mainly by the native population for the past thousand years. The San Miguel mission was first mentioned in writing in 1628, indicating it was in use at that point as both a mission and a school. Although intended as a mission, the Spanish also used it as their parish church until the parroquia was completed. The original San Miguel church was probably much smaller than the structure present, with more of a rectangular apse, a slight 
slightly raised sanctuary and a simple front elevation with no towers at all. The surviving foundations were excavated and closely researched by Bruce Ellis and Stanley Stubbs in 1955. Although the present building dates from 1710, it has undergone a multitude of significant structural changes since its infamous riot in which partially destroyed the building during the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. This was an uprising of mostly the indigenous Pueblo peoples against the Spanish colonizers in Santa Fe de Nuevo, Mexico. The Pueblo Revolt killed around 400 Spaniards and drove the remaining 2,000 settlers out of the province, which is where the creepy stuff kind of sits around. Since its construction, there have been over 300 years of ghostly apparitions seen at these ruins. You can never really pinpoint a specific person at this location, but there are numerous sightings that have been documented over the years, ranging from ghost horses, dragging sounds, and loud bangs resembling warfare. The San Miguel Chapel still stands after 400 years due to its local, national, and international community that has supported its preservation and history. Everybody chipping in. I love it. Little TLC. I bet you this is also where you see ghosts on different floors that used to be there or behind walls that don't even exist anymore. Like, are they bound by these structures forever? They're just like... No. Forever? Number four, La Posada Hotel. 1882. Located at 330 East Palace Avenue in Santa Fe, New Mexico, La Posada Hotel is more than 100 years old, finishing construction in 1884. A lively and prominent spot for celebrities in town during the 1900s, it was originally built to be the home of Mr. Abraham and Mrs. Julia Stab. Perfect last name for the start of something scary. Stab. A prominent businessman and a German immigrant, Abraham had constructed this beautiful Grand French Second Empire estate ready to make a life working with his brother Zodak in business and eventually settling down in this historic town with the mansion acting as a social hub for both the business and celebrity events. It is said that the Stabs have seven children, one of which died at birth and which in fact led Miss Stab to an oppressed self-exile state dying at the age of only 52. The mansion was converted into a hotel in 1936 shortly after the rubble of the depression had cleared and it is said that Julia herself haunts the rooms of La Posada Hotel. Guests have made claims to hear voices in vacant bedrooms, lights flickering on and off and even doors slamming in the middle of the night. Voices saying things like, I'm in here. It's never just like casual and calm like, oh yeah, yeah just leave the door open, I'm in here, come on in. It's always a creepy whisper in here like, I'm in here. Too creepy. La Posada Hotel Resort and Spa still remains one of New Mexico's most haunted hotels and is active and encourages overnighters to check out the Julia Stab package, which involves a ghostly tour, history lesson of the grounds, a lovely dinner away from the kids, and a day done right by the pool or spa. Unfortunately, I won't be taking them up on the stab package at any time soon. Not at all. No chance. I hear one thing in the middle of the night and I'm out. And I'm up quickly. 12 seconds flat. I'm just like, Number three, the Old State Penitentiary, 1885. The Old State is located 15 miles south of central Santa Fe and is an active men's maximum security prison that was built in 1885. Acting as a prison system for the US, the prison saw three massive riots in its entirety, including 1922, 1953, and the worst and most bloody riot of all. 1980. One of the worst prison riots in American history. It's presumed to be the reason behind its haunting reputation. On February 2nd, 1980, several inmates initiated a riot which led to the inmates gaining control over the prison for a full day and a half. Unfortunately at the time, post 70s, the prison was overcrowded, underfunded, and riddled with untrained, fresh-faced security guards with the rampant need for excess bodies due to the overgrowing inmate count. After escaping and organizing this event, the cellmates then tortured 12 prison guards and brutally murdered 33 other inmates. These riots soon became medieval in nature, gruesome and truly evil. The most famous area for paranormal sightings can be heard and seen around cell block four. Men here were brutally butchered, dismembered, decapitated, and some even hung up on the cells and burned alive. This section of the prison was closed in 1998 and is now referred to as Old Main. As if that history isn't dark enough, witnesses and researchers claim that there's a ton of spirits that roam this prison. Dark figures and ghostly shadows have been seen roaming the cells and halls, unexplainable slamming of cell doors, men's voices, strange noises, and even echoed screams can be heard at this location. This is why I don't even jaywalk people. Stay a couple nights at this haunted prison looking at axe marks on the ground? Yeah, no, I'm getting my phone out right away. I know exactly who I'm gonna call. Yeah, 
Number two, the Amador Hotel. Located at 251 West Amador Street at the corner of Water Street and Las Cruces, which translates to The Crosses, an area in New Mexico spanning as far back as the settled early 1800s, was thought to be an early mass gravesite for the amount of crosses present in the city. The Amador Hotel has stood serving the community in multiple ways over the years, including a courthouse, a post office, a bank, hotel, and even a county office center. Uh, yeah, can I get uh, two stamps, please? Thanks. Built in 1866, the Amador Hotel is a popular Las Cruces ghost tour, and some of the rooms were even used as jail cells. Hey, you're grounded for 15 years to life. I don't know. The courthouse is completed in 1885. Amador added another story to the remaining structure, and Amador Hall became a community center where people conversed in drinking and in storytelling. During tours, guests have reported seeing shadowy figures lurking in the hallways, numerous cold spots, flashlights turning on and off by themselves, and having their arms even touched or scratched. Ah. Oh yeah, that's it. Just a little to the left. That's perfect. Some even say it's the work of a little ghost girl named Annie, who frequently visits the room on the second floor, giggling. Like giggling is great and all until like a 200 year old spirit giggles right in your face. Like what is still funny? This is terrifying. Joke must have been that good. Little ghost girls? Yeah, that's the scariest ghosts imaginable. 100%. The Amador Hotel Ghost Tour starts at 8pm and during a visit through the tour of the grounds, history and ghost hunting begins. I'm a strict matinee ghost hunter myself, only during the day. Or never. Or like around brunch, that's like perfect, nice and sunny. And coming in at number one, Double Eagle Restaurant. If you're heading down to Mesilla, New Mexico this weekend and enjoy burgers and ghost stories, well, then the Double Eagle Restaurant is a must stop for you. Known not only for the world's largest green pepper chili burger, this blast from the past decorated head to toe in its luxurious upscale Victorian decor is now the home to two prominent and active restaurants, the Double Eagle and Pepper's Cafe. All right, here we go, let's dive in. Possibly the world's most haunted restaurants, originally owned by the Mace family, owning one of the leading and most lucrative import-export businesses in Santa Fe, was Senor and Senora Mace. Senora Mace expected only the best for her eldest son, Armando. Mothers and their sons, right? Always imaginarily wiping something off their faces. Come here, come, just, there's more. There is grim history here, involving two forbidden star-crossed lovers and a pair of sewing scissors. Reep, reep. Thank you. The Double Eagle restaurant is not only home for great food, beautifully handcrafted cocktails, but also home to a double homicide gruesome murder in which these victims' souls would seem to be trapped within these walls forever. Armando, son and heir to his parents' business, falling head over heels in love with the family's household servant named Enos. Although Enos reciprocated such feelings about Armando, their relationship had to remain a secret due to Armando's mother's strict ordinance and the difference in the teenager's social and political positions. When Sonora Mays discovered this relationship, she demanded that it end at once and banished Enos from her home indefinitely. It is said that one day Sonora Mays came home, and unexpectedly interrupting the lovers, mid-swoon, entranced by their love as she grabbed her sewing scissors from the basket on the patio and attacked Enos, stabbing and killing her. As she prepared to strike again, Armando, her son, threw his body in front of Enos and was stabbed instead. Yeah, that's some Romeo and Juliet stuff there, people. The murders were held in the famous Carlotta Salon Room, which can be visited at any time. A heavily requested stop where spooky goers can see a newspaper article titled Young Lover Ghosts on display, as well as an array of pictures taken of the young ghost lovers together over the years. That's terrifying. Here's the room. Here's what happened. Here's some proof. That's all I need to know, I've made my mind up. For never was a story of more woe than this of Enos and her Armando. And I tried to end on somewhat of a happy note. Love lasts forever and that's what I'm taking from this. Number five on this list is Villa Paula. This haunted place is located in Miami and has quite the interesting guests in the backyard. Thrillist says, this stately white mansion was originally constructed as the Cuban consulate in the mid 1920s, home to Consul Domingo Ingo Millard and his wife Paula. The Cuban-born Paula was known to spend her days playing piano and drinking Cuban coffee until she died from complications from a leg amputation in 1932. Legend has it that Domingo interred his late wife in a sarcophagus laid in the backyard. The sarcophagus is still there now, covered by ficus tree roots and nearly impossible to reach. Whether or not it actually contains her mortal remains is debatable 
debatable at best, but reports of her ghost persist. It's said her ghost is in different rooms there, says History Miami's Dr. Paul George. People who've lived at Villa Paula since have had existential kinds of experiences. Among them, phantom coffee smells and piano playing, a one-legged woman roaming about as well. So there is a literal sarcophagus just chilling in this person's backyard. Can you imagine having that just show up on the house listing? I'd be like, um, no, we are not okay with that. I'm kind of surprised that no one has gone to go deal with the sarcophagus before. I mean, you can't just leave this thing down there like that and expect the ghost to just go away. I would imagine that Paula's spirit is probably tied to the sarcophagus and in turn it's tied to the area. Granted, I do kind of understand why no one wants to dig it up. Think about all the crazy stuff that's happened with the pyramids. You dig up this sarcophagus and you might end up being cursed for life. Which is obviously something that nobody wants. But now we're left in this awkward place where we can't get rid of the ghost but at the same time can't live here either. That's why I'm recommending to all of you watching, just avoid Villa Paula altogether. Number four on this list is the Blue Anchor Pub. So this is an interesting one because this pub didn't actually start in Florida. Thrillist says this pub was built in 1840s London during Jack the Ripper time, so it should be no surprise that it's haunted. The story goes that the bar was raised in London, but it's wooden interiors were sent to New York City and then onto this sleepy So Florida town in 1996. Little did anyone know that the pub's original elements came with the ghost of Bertha Starkley, a cheating wife who was murdered by her husband. Today she can be heard rattling pots, knocking things over, and wailing in the middle of the night at the Blue Anchor. Every night around 10 p.m., the time that she was murdered, Bertha likes to remind everyone she's still here so the current owners ring the ship's bell to scare her away. So first thing, I've never actually heard of that before where they take a building from one continent and then just decide to move it over to another continent. This bar must look pretty cool on the inside to go to all that trouble though. Obviously this was a bit of a mistake and everyone would have been better served if we relocated this thing straight to the dump. Bertha doesn't care if it's in London or America or anywhere. As long as the structure of this pub is still intact, her ghost will still be floating around, which makes it very hard to enjoy a night out at this place. Like imagine drowning several pints, going to take a and then getting ambushed by some 1800s ghost in the bathroom with your pee pee hanging out. Like, I don't know if I'd ever be able to recover from that, folks. Number three on this list is St. Augustine's Lighthouse. Ah, yes, the haunted lighthouse. A true classic. Thrillist says St. Augustine's iconic lighthouse is a Florida landmark built in 1874 but climb up its 219 steps, and it's not just the views that will take your breath away. First, there's the ghost of Joseph Andrew, the original lighthouse keeper who fell to his death while painting the 165 foot tower. Then there are the Pity's two daughters who were playing with a building cart when it broke loose and slid into the nearby bay, drowning them both. While the girls giggle and run up and down the lighthouse steps, Joseph has been reported smoking cigars at the top of the lighthouse, keeping watch over his forever home. You know guys, if I had to be a ghost, then being Joseph wouldn't be the worst. I get to look out at the pretty scenery at the top of my lighthouse where hardly anyone bothers me and I get to smoke cigars all day. Like, obviously I wouldn't want to be a ghost, but if I had to be, then this wouldn't be that bad. Either way, I'm not a ghost now. I am very much a human being, and if I want to stay a human being, then I recommend avoiding this place. It can obviously be very jarring to see two little ghost girls running around, and even though all of these ghosts are supposed to be pretty chill, we know that the paranormal can be unpredictable. 
wall. I'm sure that there are tons of other non-haunted Florida lighthouses around if you're really pining for a good view. Number two on this list is Fort East Martello. If you don't like dolls, then you really won't like this one, guys. Thrillist says, if there is one rule all Floridians follow, it's do not mess with Robert the doll. The four foot figurine has terrorized anyone who hasn't taken him seriously since he was gifted to artist Robert Jean Otto in 1904. Otto blamed any mischievous act around him on Robert the doll, effectively coining the oft-repeated Robert did it mantra. The doll currently holds court inside Fort East Martello, where he lives inside a glass case surrounded by a constant soundtrack of haunting xylophone music. The room evokes a heavy air immediately upon entering, and the walls are papered with apology notes from cocky tourists who've dared cross the world's most haunted plaything. Even the Prince of Darkness himself, Ozzy Osbourne, felt Robert's wrath when he suffered a series of health mishaps shortly after dissing the doll on his reality show. I don't like dolls, folks, especially the haunted variety, so this entry obviously had to make the list. Clearly, it curses you after you see it because people literally have to come back here and ask for its forgiveness. I don't know if the notes work or not, but I guess that's all you can do when you're dealing with a haunted doll. Hopefully this doll can just chill out and stop haunting people, but in the meantime, I just flat out avoid going to this place in Florida altogether. And number one on this list is Casa Monica Resort and Spa. It really sucks that this place is so haunted because it's truly beautiful. Thrillist says St. Augustine's fanciest hotel is also its most haunted. In fact, this five-star Mediterranean revival haunt is a hotbed of spectral activity. Children are heard running along along the fourth floor, but no one is there. The radio in the Ponche de Leon suite randomly comes on, but no one's there. Guests of room 411 wake up to people staring at them, but no one's there. But it's the three-story Flagler suite high in the tower that's most haunted. Maids have seen a child's handprint appear on the first floor bathroom mirror, and after knocking, one heard a man say, we've been expecting you from an empty bedroom. Its spookiest claim to fame, however, is the male ghost staring out of the top tower window. He's believed to be the ghost of one of two people, either Franklin Smith, the architect who built the hotel, or Henry Flagler, the man who purchased it. I personally don't care if it's the architect, the man who purchased it, or God. Anyone who says, I've been waiting for you as I enter an empty bedroom, it's not the type of individual I want to be around. Also, where are these children coming from and what are those sounds? Okay, so you want to tell me a scary story where the architect of the building fell in love with his work and then when he died, his ghost stayed here. All right, fine, I can buy that, I can believe that. But like, what are the children doing here? What do they have to do with this place and the architect? Maybe this is just one of those spots where it doesn't matter what happened here, it doesn't matter what will happen here in the future, it's just always destined to be haunted. In at number four, we have the Soap Factory. The Soap Factory was at its peak during the soap boom of the 1880s, though now the factory has been left abandoned. The Soap Factory is one of the oldest factories in Minneapolis. While the process of making soap required lots of fats, lie in extremely hot temperatures, therefore it wasn't the most glorious or safest workplace in its day. Furthermore, the fats came from animal carcasses, thousands of them. The flow of blood and skin leaked into the great river next door in the turn of the century. The building smell of flesh made it a hot spot for stray dogs that the city paid to be rounded up and sent to the end of their life. If that's not creepy enough, there are legends regarding malpractice taking place at the factory, with animal fats from local restaurants taken to be made into soap. And there were also rumors of child labor at the factory. But whatever you choose to believe, there is no denying that the site contains negative energy. Now the basement of the abandoned factory is used for haunted tours. The tour is so scary in fact that guests have to sign a waiver and have to be 18 to go on the tour. In at number 3 we have First Avenue. Located in downtown Minneapolis, the building which is now home to this nightclub has a rounded front, is painted black and has white stars on its side walls with the name 
names of many of the musical talents who have done shows in one of these three event rooms found inside. Before it was famous for being a nightclub, the first avenue was a Greyhound Depot. The first avenue legend has to do with the building's former self, the Great Art Deco Greyhound Bus Center that opened on 7th Street in 1937. The story goes that a young woman went to the station to meet her boyfriend who was returning home from World War II. When she was informed that he had died in combat, she ran into the restroom and ended her life due to heartbreak. In recent years, multiple First Avenue staffers have reported seeing a ghost in the washroom. The ghost has been reportedly described as a woman always in a green army jacket and sometimes seen dancing at the club along with other ghosts. Legend says that many homeless people died in the bus station as well and they can be seen dancing with the women. There have been reports of another spirit haunting the nightclub. The staffers nicknamed this spirit Slippy. While this particular ghost is said to make a balloon appear from nowhere which then floats up and down the staircase on its own. Dave Schrade, a paranormal investigator, visited First Avenue to assess the paranormal activity in the building multiple times and has concluded that the building is indeed haunted by many spirits, indicating that the record room is the most active area of the site. While DJs that have played at the venue have reported frequently hearing strange noises through their headphones such as growls, voices and screams, other performers report their equipment being pushed off stage with no explanation. In at number 2 we have Schmidt Brewery. Schmidt Brewery became the largest in Minnesota by 1860, producing 1200 barrels annually and shipping them as far south as Tennessee. It was restructured as the St. Paul Brewing Company in 1898 before being sold to Jacob Schmidt soon after in 1900. Since its opening in 1884, many ghost hunters have visited the Schmidt Brewery to experience some of the many rumoured paranormal activities. The brewery has been the site of many constant unexplainable instances, from fires to people losing their lives to terrible accidents. This place has seen a lot of scary sights. While the victims Victims of these events linger around to haunt the grounds of the brewery. Even though the building is now used as an artist's loft, that doesn't take away the scary history of the Schmidt Brewery. While most of the ghosts that haunt the grounds of the old brewery have to do with ordinary brewery workers dying in terrible accidents, in 1896 two workers lost their lives in an explosion. Furthermore, in 1902 a worker fell down an unmarked elevator shaft. Additionally, in 1904 Matthew Colo, a worker whose job was to light gas lamps in the brewery, lost his life from inhaling flames. Schmidt brewery has been a St. Paul haunt since 1855 for more than a couple of reasons. When owner Jacob Schmidt took down the original North Star Brewery sign, replacing it with his namesake, Jacob Schmidt Brewing Company. The entire brewery burned down a year later in 1900. Plenty of other bad luck would also follow on the grounds of the brewery, suspected due to the tragic death of many workers of the brewery. And finally, in at number one, we have Four Pals Restaurant. Known as the most haunted restaurant in Minnesota, the Four Pals has a tragic story. Located in St. Paul, Four Pals was a high end restaurant located in Irvine Park, and the restaurant is a beautiful Victorian mansion. Sadly, though, the restaurant is now permanently closed. The dark stories about Four Pals Restaurant hint that the historic mansion is seriously haunted. As the story goes, back in the late 1800s, Joseph Forpau had an affair with the mansion's maid, Molly. It was not long before his wife discovered this relationship and love for Mary. Therefore, the wife became extremely jealous of the servant and assigned Molly to do chores that would keep her away from the bedrooms and away from Joseph. Molly became pregnant and Joseph ended the affair, but Molly was so distraught about the whole situation that she ended her life. According to reports, she ended her life in the attic. Joseph was upset when he heard the news about Molly that he figured he could not stay in the house where his beloved died. One day he went out for a walk and ended his life as well. Since then, restaurant guests and employees have reported creepy sightings of a woman dressed in 1800s attire, lights turning off and on by themselves, and strange noises coming from the attic. In one case, the disturbances were so chaotic that it led to an investigation by the St. Paul police, whose canine dog refused to enter the attic. It is said that Joseph and Molly both haunt four pals, but many guests have said Molly is more active spirit. People say they have seen the two walking around the dining area, but Molly bangs on walls and smashed his glasses. Some people say they can smell her lavender perfume. That being said, Mr. Fourpower is also sometimes seen and his ghost has been reported wearing a dark waistcoat, silk vest, pinstripe trousers and a derby hat. He can be seen going to the basement at which time the lights flicker and shuffling noises are heard. He roams the house and has been caught on film many times. The former staff of the restaurant have also reported on many occasions when they would go floor by floor turning off lights as they close down for the night. Then when the staff members get in their cars to leave, they'll know 
notice the top floor light is on. Nevertheless, if the restaurant is haunted, the story of Mr. Fourpow and Molly is one of the most devastating to date. Coming in at number five, we have William A. Irvin. During the fall season, the ship has haunted tours with actors, but the ship really is haunted. The haunted ship began in Duluth in 1992. Before the haunted ship started, the William A. Irvin was open for regular boat tours during the month of October. Historically, this month was really slow, and the DECC needed a way to generate more revenue during this quiet month. Having heard about a failed attempt by Cleveland's William G. Mather trying to become a haunted ship, the DECC decided to try their own hands at a haunted attraction. The William A. Irvin partnered up with UMD to give the school's drama department some experience on production and acting. Needless to say, their attempt was a huge success. More than two decades later, the haunted ship is the peak of the Irvin's yearly business. The most common sighting that employees relate is that a lady in white has been seen walking around the ship, noticeably. She is usually up on deck and is dressed in period clothing. Nobody has ever been able to identify who she is or why she is tied to the vessel. There is also said to be a former captain who is still overseeing his ship. He is most often seen in the captain's chair and is said to be angry that the ship remains in dock and is no longer seaworthy. There are another two men haunting the ship. One sticks to the front of the ship and apparently does not understand what has happened to him, while the other sticks to the rear of the ship and has confirmed that he died after falling from a ladder. The family of the second man has come forward and said the story surrounding his death was always suspicious and they were denied a claim to his pension. In a number four, we have Enger Tower. The 82 year old watchtower can be found right in the middle of Enger Par. The tower was built in 1939 and looks over the Duluth Harbour, being known as one of the most well known haunted places in Minnesota and for good reason. The tower is 531 feet above Lake Superior and is built of bluestone from local sources. Enger Tower was first dedicated by Crown Prince Olaf and Crown Princess Martha of Norway on June 15th. It was built as a tribute to businessman Bert Enger, who passed away in 1931. The dedication was in honor of Bert Enger, native of Norway who came to this country and became a successful furniture dealer. At the time of his death, Mr. Enger donated two thirds of his estate to the city of Duluth. This included the land known as Enger Hill, which along with Enger Tower is also the home of Enger Park and Enger Golf Course. The tower can be seen almost anywhere throughout the city and has since been restored. There is a local legend that a man took his own life in 1948 by jumping off the fifth level of Enger Tower. They say his body has been found hours later but was never identified. That being said, there are numerous ghost stories of visitors seeing a man on the fifth floor of the tower before entering, but when they reach the top, he is gone. Coming in at number three, we have Van Dusen Mansion. In 1892, great in 1892, grain baron George Van Dusen built a monumental mansion for his family. With 12,000 square feet, 10 fireplaces, a turret, and a $45,000 price tag, the home was a symbol of turn of the century prosperity. After two generations of Van Dusens moved out in 1937, the building had been used to house almost everything except a family since, being used as a school, training medical facility, and even a college throughout the years. It was vacant in the late 1930s and spent 20 years as the college of commerce. It was home to Hamline University Law School, then the Horse International Education Center. In the late 1980s, the castle fell on hard times and became little more than a flop house. By the early 90s, it was headed for the wrecking ball. Two weeks before it was scheduled to be demolished, it was rescued by Wisconsin entrepreneur Bob Poling, who bought it for $237,000. Now a venue to hold fairy tale esque weddings, the Van Dusen Mansion has had its fair share of past lives. In the number two, we have Mounds Theatre. The renovated theatre and 86 year old movie house can be found in Minnesota. The old theatres have been rumored for the past several years to be a home of community of creepy ghosts. One story goes as the Mounds was built in 1922 and operated as a movie house until 1967. When it closed so abruptly that when volunteers arrived many years later to renovate the place, they found popcorn on the floor. The subject of paranormal TV shows and professional ghost hunting investigations, the theatre is allegedly haunted by a trio of ghosts, a happy little girl who bounces a ball on stage, a cursed old man that, who lurks in the shadowy corners of the projection booth, and a crestfallen usher who walks up and down the aisles in search of his lost love. The ghosts in the theatres are so active that the owner had a party of four ghostbusters in a projection room sit in one dark and stormy October night. The dim light was extinguished and the room grew chilled. The owner stated that as the four sat silently awaiting their fate, shivering in the dark, and all at once there was the sound of a man crying. 
crying. When investigating the sounds of the crying man, they found a shadow figure in the corner of the room. The figure reported having black glittering eyes and an aura of anger. Because of the odd ghost encounter and negative energy, they had to abruptly end the ghost investigation before it was too late. Another former owner who reopened the theatre in 2001 claims that the spirits of the theatre have gone physical and grabbed them while they were working late at night. Some paranormal investigators have left with claw marks on their backs, but the scariest ghost of them all is considered the young girl. This is the theatre's most notorious ghost and is seen in a pink dress, often bouncing a ball on the stage. And finally, in the number one, we have Anoka State Hospital. Located in Anoka Town is the Anoka State Hospital, which is arguably the most haunted place in Minnesota. The Anoka Hospital was the first state asylum for individuals that were deemed insane. The building was established in 1898 and opened in 1900 to admit patients from other state asylums that had become too crowded. The first 100 patients were males from St. Peter's State Hospital and were considered to be chronic incurables, men who had lost their minds due to heredity, causes or environment. In 1906, 115 women were also transferred to the asylum from St. Peter's State Hospital. Residents were not to receive any type of treatment at this asylum, as this was the final stop for them until they passed away. And passed they did. A total of 86 of the original patients were buried in numbered graves in the asylum cemetery. The original name of the institution was Anoka State Asylum, but in an attempt to soften the image, they changed its name in 1937 to the Anoka State Hospital. Although the name was kinder and gentler, treatment at the facility was not. Patients were subjected to medical experiments and suffered both mental and physical harm. The original hospital complex closed in 1999 and residents were transferred to a new facility located close by. The buildings and property were then given to Anoka County to use for offices and to house the county workhouse. The remainder of the buildings were closed and boarded up. With such a terrifying past, it is no wonder that the Anoka State Hospital has been rumored to house the spirits of past patients. Former employees have reported that while unusual occurrences happen throughout the buildings, the most paranormal activities are linked to the tunnels located below the buildings. These tunnels were used as a way of transferring patients from one building to another without risking escape. Ironically, many patients believe these tunnels would lead them to freedom, and so they tried to escape by going down into them, but after a few twists and turns, escapees realized that the tunnels were more of a maze than an escape route. Without an understanding of where each tunnel went and how they joined together, it was easy to get hopelessly lost in them. Several escapees became so disorientated and distraught that they took the only way out that they felt was left to them and ended their lives. For years, employees would report hearing footsteps trudging through the tunnels, stopping, pausing. There was also reports of whispering and low voices in conversation, but the words were not understood. The paranormal activities became so rampant that most employees refused to use the tunnels because they were just too eerie. Today, only maintenance and security are allowed in them. Today, the county owns the buildings that made up the former insane asylum complex. Although the complex was eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, it appears that time has passed. The current buildings are in a state of extreme disrepair. Coming in at number five, we have Hotel Park Central. Located on Central Avenue in Albuquerque, you'll find Hotel Park Central. The original building was constructed in 1924 and served as a hospital. It was then purchased in the 1980s and transformed into a mental health hospital. However, in 2010, a major renovation occurred with a $21 million investment and it became the luxury hotel that we know today. The hauntings in this building date back to the time it served as a hospital. Patients would report seeing apparitions, hearing voices, seeing objects move, and feeling the presence of other beings when nobody was there. As well, when it was a mental hospital, it was known by patients and workers that on the top floor on the right wing, there is a ghost of a woman that likes to watch people in the hallways. Patients also reported having their bed sheets pulled off them in the middle of the night. Patients were not the only ones to experience things that couldn't be explained though. Staff of the hospital did too. They would often have the sense of being watched, as well as hearing something whisper in their ear. The movement of objects and a general sense of heaviness throughout the buildings. Today, many guests at the hotel report similar paranormal experiences, as many guests report feeling watched in the presence of unseen beings. They have also reported hearing voices and shuffling in the stairwells. Several guests have also seen a female apparition on the third floor wing. A group of paranormal investigators were brought onto the scene of the hotel. The investigators were three team members who all all experienced unexplained voices and whispering while close to the hotel. They also reported distinct coolness near their bodies and a sense of being watched. After reviewing their evidence, some of these experiences were captured on digital voice recorders. They also carried out the flashlight technique, an attempt at communication with the spirit that involves the ant 
answering of questions through the turning on and off of the flashlight. This was a success with several responses captured on video. In at number four, we have the St. James Hotel. Built in 1972 by Henry Lambert, the St. James Hotel was established. Found in Cimarron, New Mexico, the hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in America. The St. James Hotel is said to remain host to several restless spirits. Both the owners and the hotel guests will tell you that many unexplained events haunt it. Several psychics have visited the hotel and specifically identified three spirits and many others who passed through to relive their experiences. The hotel's second floor is the most active, with stories of cold spots and the smell of cigar smoke lingering in the halls. A prior manager commented about the spirits that linger in the hotel and said, you never see them but you do feel and hear them. Another report from a former owner states that she walked into the dining room and saw a pleasant looking cowboy standing behind her in the mirror on the front of the bar. The spiritual activity of the hotel has been featured on the popular television show Unsolved Mysteries and A Current Affair. Room 18 at the hotel is kept locked because it houses the ghost of an ill-tempered Thomas James Wright, who lost his life at his door just after winning the rights to the hotel in a poker game. Having been injured from behind, Wright continued into the room and slowly met the end of his life. Because of the tragic accident that happened in room 18, it is known as one of the scariest and most haunted rooms. This can be seen with one former owner who said she was pushed down while in the room and on another occasion saw a ball of angry orange light floating in the upper corner. The staff considers the room to be the most haunted and people are rarely allowed to enter this room, much less sleep in it. Rumours abound that when the room was rented, several mysterious deaths occurred there. Other unknown entities are also said to roam the hotel, creating a host of paranormal activities. Staff report that items constantly fall off walls and shelves and electrical equipment at the front desk behaves unpredictably. Others have reported cold spots throughout the historic inn, lights that seemingly turn on by themselves, feelings of being watched by unseen eyes, and cameras that cease to work inside the hotel, strangely returning to normal after leaving St. James. In at number three, we have Kaimo Theatre. Built in 1927, this grand palace of a theatre certainly is a masterpiece of Pablo Deco fused with Art Deco. The creation of this beautiful southwestern-style theatre was financed by a hard-working wealthy entrepreneur, Orest Bacecchi, who wanted to fulfil a lifelong dream of building a grand theatre which would rival other larger-than-life movie palaces that were springing up around the United States. A large fire in 1963 destroyed Kaimo Theatre's iconic stage and much of the building, prompting the Bacecchi family to demolish it. In 1977, the same year, the theatre was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The citizens of Albuquerque voted to purchase Kaimo Theatre at a steep discount. In return, the city of Albuquerque offered to fund the restoration of the landmark attraction. With the change of hands, local restoration experts were hired to restore Kaimo Theatre to its former glory. The hauntings of Kaimo Theatre can be traced back to a freak accident that happened in the late afternoon on August 2nd, 1951. Back then, hundreds of moviegoers were in Kaimo Theatre to catch the latest films. Without warning, a water heater located in the theatre's lobby exploded, sending scalding hot steam and plaster into the air. A total of eight people were injured in the accident, including one person losing their life, Bobby Darnell. Since then, the theatre is said to be haunted by the ghost of Bobby. Performers and staff of Kaimo Theatre have all reported strange and unexplainable activities happening in the theatre. In particular, donuts placed backstage for performers would often go missing. To appease the spirit of Bobby, an altar was erected beneath the stairs to the dressing rooms. Toys, sweets and donuts would be placed before every major performance to ensure the success of each show. Those who didn't would face a disastrous performance. Kaimo Theatre's technical manager, Dennis Potter, recounted an incident in December 19. 86 when the donuts were removed by Andrew Shear, direct of A Christmas Carol, just minutes before the first show. It did not take long before the disaster occurred. Electrical cables fell, lights exploded, doors on the set opened without warning, and performers had forgotten their lines. After the end of the disastrous show, the donuts were promptly replaced and the next show went off without a hiccup. However, an interview with Andrew contradicted the Potter's story, with the former claiming that the donuts were never removed or replaced. Apart from the unexplainable disruptions, staff working at Kaimo Theatre have also reported seeing the ghost of Bobby, dressed in a striped shirt and blue pants. The ghost of Bobby is often seen loitering on the lobby staircase, looking for the next victim of his harmless shenanigans. In at number two, we have La Fonda Hotel. Stand
Sunny in Santa Fe, New Mexico, there is the historic La Fonda Hotel. Over the years, the hotel was destroyed and rebuilt several times over. In 1821, when Captain William Becknell blazed the path of what would become known as the Santa Fe Trail, he stayed at a La Fonda, where the trail terminated at the town central plaza. As more and more pioneers traveled the Santa Fe Trail, the La Fonda became a popular destination for trappers, traders, mountain men, soldiers, politicians, and the like. The current La Fonda was built in 1922 on the site of the previous inns. In 1925, it was acquired by the Atchison Topeka Santa Fe Railroad, which leased it to Fred Harvey. For more than 40 years, from 1926 to 1968, La Fonda was one of the famous Harvey houses, a renowned chain of fine hotels. Today, the La Fonda Hotel is said to host not only travelers visiting Santa Fe, but also several ghosts. Some people believe that the Honorable Judge Slough continues to walk its hallways. However, more often reported is the ghost of the distraught salesman who jumped into the well after losing all of his company's money. The hotel's dining room called the La Plazuela is situated directly over the old well and both guests and staff alike have reported the sight of a ghostly figure that walks to the center of the room, then seemingly jumps into the floor and disappears. Other reported phenomena include a ghost that haunts the Santa Fe room, as well as the spirit that walks the hallways near the La Terraza, a restaurant located on the east side of the hotel's third floor. In the 1970s, a ghost reportedly called the front desk to complain that someone was walking up and down the hallway in front of his room. When an employee was sent to investigate, he saw a tall man in a long black coat disappear into a stairwell. However, when he followed him to the stairs, there was no sign of the mysterious visitor. And finally, in at number one, we have the Luna Mansion. The Luna Mansion in Los Lunas, New Mexico, is known for one thing, and it's its ghost stories. Over the years, the Luna Mansion in Los Lunas has gained a reputation as being haunted. Guests and staff alike have shared stories of unexplained activity, which some chalk up to the paranormal. Over the years, the mansion changed hands several times before it was purchased and renovated as a fine dining establishment in the 1970s. It was then that the ghost of Josephina began to appear. Perhaps she didn't like the renovations, or maybe she just wants to stick around to make sure they were doing a good job on the home that she had spent so many years looking after. Dressed in 1920s period clothing, she had been described by employees as appearing very real. Most often, she's seen in two former bedrooms on the second floor, an attic, storeroom, and at the top of the stairs leading to the second floor bar. At the top of the stairs sits an old rocking chair, which she has often been seen sitting in and rocking slowly. On one occasion when an employee approached the ghost, she simply stood up and then slowly vanished. More often she is seen walking up and down the stairs, a habit that has been so commonplace that employees barely notice anymore. Where there's one spirit, others seem to follow and more ghostly apparitions have been seen at the mansion. One of these is a former servant named Cruz, who was thought to have been a groundskeeper. Most often seen on the main level, he is said to be particularly friendly to women and children and likes to play practical jokes on the employees and patrons. On one occasion, he was seen sitting on a sofa as if waiting to be served. Dressed in vintage attire, the man was relaxing patiently when a waitress asked another staff member why he hadn't been served. However, the response was, what man? And when the waitress looked back to the sofa, the vintage spirit faded away. Number five on this list is the Molly Brown House. If you live in Denver, then there is no way that you aren't familiar with this haunted place. Thrillist says, you've no doubt heard of the Molly Brown house and likely passed it on the street once or twice too. Molly Brown was a notable member of Denver's elite and perhaps known best for being a titanic survivor and despite allegedly living a relatively happy life, visitors to the museum and staff have reported quite a bit of strange happenings. Some have smelled what's believed to be husband JJ Brown's pipe or have witnessed lights off and on the fritz, and staff have reported furniture being seemingly rearranged. Sometimes, figures can even be seen roaming the house. A visit is worth it alone for the history, but the potential for getting a bit spooked or walking into a cold spot is definitely an added bonus. We once again have one of those locations where no one has any idea why it's haunted. It just is. Maybe it's the connection to the Titanic that has got this place acting funky. Obviously, that was a very unnatural occurrence and took the lives of tons of people in a very sad way. So, I could believe that the Titanic and the survivor of the Titanic plays some role into why this place is haunted the way that it is. Good news is, 
is that this isn't the worst haunting that you can run into. Like yes, you will get a little scared for sure. You might smell something funny or have a ghost pull something on you or even maybe have small valuables go missing. But ultimately you probably shouldn't be dragged to the underworld here by some shadow demon or anything like that. So I guess if you were to visit any place on this list then this one wouldn't be the worst. Just be prepared for what's coming because if you aren't then it could leave you with some serious mental trauma. Number four on this list is Phantom Canyon Road. You need to be very careful on this road because there is a good chance you could suffer a serious crash if you aren't. Thrillist says a haunted road is one thing but a haunted road in Colorado means you're likely on the edge of a mountain and at some serious elevation. Phantom Canyon Road is a detour off the Gold Belt Tour byway connecting Cripple Creek and Florence and was originally the railroad for that route. As you drive along you can clearly see the ghost towns of Wilbur, Adelaide, and Glenbrook and legend has it that the reason for Phantom Canyon's name is credited to sightings of a man wearing a prison uniform walking along the tracks in the 1890s. The man supposedly had been executed at the Colorado State Penitentiary a few days earlier. So yeah guys, you better have your wits about you because if you don't, this ghost might come out and startle the crap out of you and then the next thing you know, you're going to be face deep into a tree somewhere. It also just adds to the horror ambiance that you're driving past several ghost towns along the way. Like of course they just had to be on the side of the road as you're also getting stalked by this ghost prisoner. No one really knows what this prisoner wants with you but let's face it I can't imagine it's good. My dude was executed back in the day so for one what he did was probably pretty bad to warrant a punishment like that and then secondly he literally got executed and I can only guess that his his ghost probably isn't too pleased about that. Y'all need to be especially careful if you're driving down this road because at any point this guy could pop out. Number three on this list is Central City Masonic Cemetery. Of course we had to have a cemetery on this list. No haunted place list would be complete without at least one of them. Thrillist says, founded as a mining town in the late 1800s, Central City is now known as a destination for those looking to head to the hills for a game gambling fix in the casinos that now dot the area. But one thing hasn't changed. The woman in black who twice a year appears in this hilltop cemetery above the town. Known as the Columbine Lady, she comes to visit the grave of John Cameron, a prominent former resident of Central City who died in 1884. Some believe she is his fiance, appearing to leave flowers for her lost love on November 1st, the anniversary of Cameron's death and April 5th, a date for which the significance remains a mystery, much like the woman herself. This place is safe to go to if of course you do not go during these times. She's been coming for a long time and anyone who tried to interfere with her has had to pay the price. Now people kind of suspect that she was in a relationship with John Cameron, but there's also another theory. Many people think that John actually wronged her in his life and that this woman in black comes twice a year to double check that John is still dead and hasn't come back to life by some means. Pretty scary tale for sure, one that you probably don't want to get involved with. Number two on this list is the Broadmoor. Located in Colorado Springs, this hotel would be freaking awesome if it wasn't so haunted. Thrillist says this sprawling five-star hotel has a lot to offer for anyone seeking a relaxing and indulgent getaway. But along with the golf course, spa, and nearby zoo, there's one feature you won't find in any brochure. Sure. Staff and guests alike have reported the presence of a woman, often in the penthouse where Julia Penrose, co-founder of the property, once lived. While not confirmed, Penrose's death is said to have been surrounded by a strange occurrence in which she went missing and was later found confused and shaking in the woods nearby with no memory of how she got there. She passed away a week later and perhaps her spirit remains watching over the property and seeking answers about her own mysterious death. Now now I'm wondering man, 
how did Penrose die? Like this whole story feels like a movie or something like that. I truly think somebody needs to get in here and investigate what the heck happened here. Cause like, should we be scared of the region because this is gonna happen again? Was Julia doing something specific before she disappeared and should we avoid doing that thing? There are just so many questions that need to be answered here and sadly I can't do it from the comfort of Toronto. That being said, I'm also not trying to end up like Julia and therefore we'll be leaving this job to somebody far more qualified. And finally, number one on this list is the Highlands Ranch Mansion. A truly picturesque mansion, one that's been standing for over 100 years and one that's home to a ghostly spirit. Thrillist says this sprawling stone mansion built in 1891 is often rented for weddings and events due to its impressive structural beauty and picturesque prairie views. But it's also a historic property and somewhat of a museum of the times with a bit of paranormal activity sprinkled in. The ghost of Julia Kistler, daughter of F. Kistler, who bought the property in 1926, is said to haunt the home with visitors and staff alike reporting hearing a woman's sobs, seeing a silhouette figure moving about when the mansion was otherwise vacant, and lights sporadically turning on and off. I don't know about you guys, but during my wedding ceremony, I want to hear beautiful sounding music, not the sobs of some ghost woman thing. Apparently she's crying all the time and this woman's emotions are not something to play with. There's a story where once several children were playing around here. There was a wedding ceremony scheduled here for later that day and the children were off doing what kids do before the proceedings got underway. They ran into this ghost crying and then they started to make fun of her. They were rude and definitely unkind but they also didn't deserve what she did next. It's said that in a fit of rage she flew inside their bodies and possessed each and every one of them for a short time showing them things that were truly terrifying. Things that have ultimately changed those boys' lives and altered their mentality forever. Any ghost that's capable of doing something like that, that's one that I don't want to be around. And coming in at number five, we have the Houghton Mansion. Built in the 1890s in North Adams, Massachusetts. For the mayor himself, Albert Charles Houghton, this neoclassical revival style mansion sits on 172 Church Street. A family man, Albert, was the president of Arnold Printworks, a prominent textile factory in North Adams. His wife, Cordelia, daughter Mary, and himself had owned and lived on the property right up until the fatal car accident which took the lives of the family in 1914. On an early summer morning, Albert and his family accompanied by another family, Dr. and Mrs. Dutton and their daughter, and of course the family chauffeur himself, Mr. Witters, had decided to head out into the countryside for a leisurely drive, a drive that ultimately took their lives. Unfortunately, for everyone on that August 1st morning, after a steep turn, the car car lost control and proceeded to screech off the road, resulting in a rolling fatal wreck. All the women in this tragedy losing their lives with the men barely surviving from the multitude of injuries. On August 11th, just 10 days after the accident, without his wife and daughter, Albert mysteriously died in the home from what doctors think was a broken heart. It is said that three ghosts haunt the Houghton Mansion, including Albert himself, Albert's daughter Mary, and the driver, Mr. Witters. The mansion remained with the Houghton family until 1926 when Albert's daughter Florence and her husband sold the building to the Freemasons. This is when the spookiness really started happening. Through its multitude of use throughout the years, additions to this historic site were added on by the Masons, using it for ritual and spiritual purposes, making this story even weirder. Over the years, there have been countless paranormal witnesses claiming that the ghosts roaming the halls of the basement, Mr. Witters himself, guilt-ridden with the responsibility of the crash, and Mr. Witters took his own life shortly after returning home with injuries, and residents that have stayed at the site have claimed that the manly figure aimlessly rummaging through the basement is the driver himself. Among these claims have another spirit lurking in Mary's bedroom. It is said that overnighters have witnessed multiple bright lights and auras flying around the bedroom in the middle of the night. I wouldn't even step foot into this house, let alone set up camp and spend the night. No way. The Houghton Mansion remains a tourist attraction and hotspot for paranormal goers worldwide and to this day is one of the most haunted and mysterious sites in all of Massachusetts. Number four, the Hoosick 
tunnel. The Hoosick Tunnel, from the Algonquin word, place of stones, and the Mohawk word, forbidden, is a 4.75 mile active railroad tunnel in western Massachusetts that passes through the Hoosick Range, an extension of Vermont's Green Mountains, and runs from Deerfield River in the town of Florida to the city of North Adams. The construction began in 1815 and ending in 1875 with a budget of two million, at the time the largest tunnel ever constructed, and it was later the result of taking lives of over 200 men during its construction entirety, earning it the nickname from locals, the Bloody Pit. This haunted, barren, five mile, completely enclosed stretch was subject to multiple accidents and deaths over the years, giving the tunnel its haunting history and reputation of being cursed itself. With the word forbidden, did the Mohawks know something that the workers didn't? Essentially, this cold, underground, pitch black hole became one of America's strangest grave sites, resulting in everything from mysterious gas leaks, dynamite explosions, roofs collapsing, and even mechanic failures resulting in a mass flood. For the past decades, there have been numerous paranormal activity witnesses who have documented strange events from police officers to the freight conductors themselves. Some of the reports over the last hundred years included numerous farmers and wagons ending up in different areas of the railroad, missing hours of time. The farmers had claimed that when spending time around the railroad and its tracks, that memory and confusion would always set in. Some residents have claimed that they have even been chased out of the tunnel by an unexpected freight train chugging along aggressively through the tunnel like a bat out of hell, and then vanishing. Numerous ghostly figures resembling workers roam the dark tunnel, and if that isn't scary enough, some people, including hearing the echoes and screams of even the workers who were buried alive under the rock, still holding their tools, or even seeing ghostly figures in pumping chambers where numerous men tirelessly making rafts not to drown. The Hoosick Tunnel remains one of the most visited and haunted places, marking it just one of the sites you'll probably never find me at. Just in 2020, the tunnel was yet again subject to a mysterious collapse resulting in months of repair. Yeah, I say stop fixing it and just let it be. Number three, the USS Salem. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Well, almost. A big boat. The USS Salem, a heavy cruiser built for World War II in 1945, was originally built for action. Its bold, aggressive architecture was one of the last as it was more of a bluff to its opponents than actually a hero of war. In May 1949, war departments handed the Salem's helm to Captain J.C. Daniel himself. The ship was built and updated with what was then the latest military tech and weapons, and it was meant to strike fear in whomever or whatever was in her way. Although the ship wasn't used in any action during World War II, it acted as a flagship, training operation, and main purpose as a threat to the naval enemy. It wasn't until the USS Salem had responded to the 1953 Ionian earthquake, or also known as the Great Kefalonia earthquake, as it hit the southern Ionian islands of Greece on August 12th, devastating the entire area. The USS Salem landed on Greek shores and acted as an improvised hospital and morgue, giving it its famous name, the Sea Witch. The ship was decommissioned shortly after its rescue and lays in Boston's harbor as a tourist attraction from all of its dark history. Some of the paranormal activities that arise on the ship include the Burning Man, who smells of rank death and can be seen in the mess hall where the bodies have been stored. Another famous apparition on the ship is the ghost girls who lurk the halls of the ship. Little ghostly figures can be seen and felt on the legs of tour goers. Some people claim that the ship is even home to hellhounds, an aggressive pack of ghostly creatures that roam the ship growling and scratching at closed doors. Yeah, the next time my dog scratches at my door, She's going up for adoption, I'm sorry. Number two, the Lizzie Borden House. This quaint bed and breakfast located at 232nd Street is home to one of America's most haunted and mysterious homes, the Lizzie Borden House. Gets its haunt from an unsolved murder of Lizzie Borden in 1892. One of the most infamous true crime figures known for her murdering of her father and stepmother with several blows to the head with a hatchet. Oof, ouch. Although acquitted, the killings remain unsolved to this day. This case earned notoriety and much that the popular local children's rhyme had been linked to this death. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That is horrible. On August 4th, 1892, Lizzie's stepmother of 27 was struck 19 times while her father Andrew was hit 11. Although Lizzie Borden was acquitted and found not guilty, the dark history draws in crowds every night for its nightly tour of the premises. The Lizzie Borden room, the infamous room where all of the murders took place, is the most requested and most popular for paranormal overnighters. And not only can you enjoy a lovely inclusive breakfast to yourself, but the nightly house tour, ghost tour, and ghost hunt attracts fans of horror every night of the year. Yeah, that's terrifying. 
and there's a jingle to it. I don't like that at all. And coming in at number one, the Salem Witch Trials. We can't talk about haunted places in Massachusetts if we're not gonna bring up the witch trials. And I'm not talking about Sabrina the Teenage Witch Witches or anything of cute of that nature. These famously documented witch trials need no introduction and unfortunately lays way to one of the most horrific events based in truth. The site of mass hysteria and hangings of supposed witches took place here and occurred in colonial Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693. More than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft or better known back then as the devil's magic and 20 were ultimately executed. Eventually the colony admitted the trials were a mistake and compensated the families of those convicted. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. I just thought uh, when you sneezed, you didn't say bless you, so I just, I would already don't like you, so I figured you were a witch, I'm really sorry. Since then, the story of the trials has become famous in paranoia and injustice, and it continues to baffle researchers to this day. We all know the famous play written by American playwright Arthur Miller in 1953, The Crucible, depicting the mass hysteria and drama during these trials. This was the perfect time if you didn't like someone that a strategic and untimely sinister accusation led to the demise of thy neighbor. I saw Sarah Good with the devil. I saw Goody Osborne with the devil. Who else don't I like? I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. Abigail, end of act one. Since the start of the trials and hysteria in North America, other European countries shortly followed with their own mass witch hunts, resulting in somewhere between 40,000 and 60,000 tried and executed for witchcraft. That's a lot of broomsticks. The Salem Witch Trials of Salem, Massachusetts is still one of the world's biggest hotspots for mystery and paranormal story. 